Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. I'm Dave Borlace and this week we're going to be taking a look at the second of the quick easy wins that each of us can adopt to reduce our home energy demand. Plus we're going to be taking a quick peek at why the weather went a little bit weird in the northern hemisphere back in February. When I moved into my home a few years back the people I bought it from had gone in for recessed ceiling lights in quite an enthusiastic way. In just the dining room, kitchen and downstairs bathroom they'd managed to squeeze in no fewer than 26 of them in total. Each of them was using a 50 watt halogen light bulb, which of course was the latest technology back then. Nowadays, LED lights are the latest technology and we're told they're much more efficient and can save us money. So I thought it was about time I did the switch. But there have been stories in the press and amongst the trades that I work with regularly as a project manager that the energy savings advertised by the LED manufacturers are not quite as big as they claim. So I've decided to do some tests to see what the real numbers are. This thing is a smart plug, another great piece of energy saving technology in its own right. They're about 15 to 20 quid. You plug it into a socket, you plug a device into it, and then you can control the device using an app on your smartphone or tablet via Wi-Fi. It also lets you see exactly how much power your devices are using via the neat little display on your smartphone. And that's exactly what I'm gonna to do today. I'm gonna to compare this brand new 50 watt halogen bulb with this brand new LED equivalent and see how much power each of them uses via the app. I got this light fitting from a local DIY superstore for 10 quid and it even came with its own LED light bulb. Three years ago you'd have paid 10 quid just for that bulb so it just shows how far the technology's come to bring the costs down. And if like me you're a middle-aged man with a shed in his garden you've probably got all sorts of rubbish like this lying around cluttering up the place. So I'm going to use this and this and this to make an electrical test rig and I can't think of a single thing that could go wrong. Okay, let's start with the halogen bulb, which is allegedly 50 watts of energy power. First thing we'll do actually is to make sure the plug is off, and it is. All right, and then with our phone, we can switch it on remotely from anywhere in the world via your Wi-Fi. And without blinding myself, if we go into our usage, put that there so you can all see it. That is showing that it's using 48.5 watts of power, which for a 50 watt bulb is pretty much spot on. So that's good. Let's switch that off. And remove it with a cloth. Now this is already hot because 80 or 90% of the energy that went into that bulb just then was dissipated as heat, not light, and that's why these things are so inefficient and why I'm not going to pick that up with my hand. So let's leave him there. And let's now try it with the LED equivalent. These things are rated at using about 6 watts, so let's have a look. Switch him back on. Go into our usage and sure enough that is using 5.9 watts of power. So actually the claimed power usage for both those bulbs is exactly what it says on the tin. Then it gets me thinking what about the numbers? How does that work out over the course of a year given that I've got 26 lights doing this in my house? So I've got 26 lights that get used on average about three hours a day. Obviously 365 days in a year and we also know that one unit on your electricity bill is one kilowatt hour, which is how much energy a 1000 watt appliance uses in one hour. My halogen bulbs are 50 watts each, so that's 1300 watts. Three hours a day equals 3.9 kilowatt hours every day. Times 365 gives us 1423.5 kilowatt hours or units per year. I pay about 14 pence per unit, so that's 199 pounds 29 per year. 
The LED bulbs are 6 watts each, so that's 156 watts in total. 3 hours a day equals 468 watt hours or 0.47 kilowatt hours. Times 365 gives us 171.6 kilowatt hours or units per year, which is 24 pounds and 2 pence. I found these bulbs online for £1.79 each, so for 26 of them it will cost me £46.54. So the total first year cost is £70.56 versus £199.29. After that, I'm saving £175 a year. And by the way, a halogen bulb lasts 2,500 hours, which is about two and a half years in my case. An LED bulb lasts 30,000 hours, which is 27 years. So if you factor that in, the savings are even greater. Right, just a bit of time left to have a look at the WTF board. Last week we dealt with the carbon cycle. This week we're going to have a look at the jet stream and the polar vortex. Our planet is warmer in the fat middle bit, called the equator, than it is at the top and bottom bits, called the poles. The warm air from the equator moves towards the cold air in the Arctic. But because the Earth also spins in an eastward direction, these air currents get dragged around with it, and it's this that results in the jet stream. At the same time, there is also a constantly spinning current of cold air very high up above the Arctic, and this is what the scientists call the polar vortex. The jet stream circulates at a height of about 6 to 7 miles above the surface of the Earth, and that's about 30,000 feet, which is the height that commercial airliners fly at, hence the name. And hence why your flight back from the shopping spree in New York is usually quite a bit quicker than your flight out there. The polar vortex is much higher at about 30 miles above the Earth's surface. The bigger the difference in temperature between the equatorial air and the Arctic air, the faster and straighter the jet stream moves around the planet. But the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the planet, and the scientists call this phenomenon Arctic amplification. I'll add that to the WTF board for a detailed look at another time. In February 2017, the Arctic region was 20 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. It was still bloody cold, mind you, at minus 8 degrees Celsius, but much less cold than previous years. The effect of this warming means two things. Firstly, the polar vortex weakens and starts to lose its neat circular shape. And secondly, the natural pull of warm equatorial air towards the cold Arctic air, which normally keeps the jet stream flowing quickly and evenly, is also weakened as the temperature difference reduces. And this means that the jet stream slows down and wobbles around. This in turn means that we get peaks and troughs in the jet stream flow. And the troughs drag cold Arctic air much further south, and the peaks drag warm equatorial air much further north. And this warm air adds even more to the warming in the Arctic, which in turn makes the polar vortex and jet stream even wobblier, and lo and behold, yet again, we've got ourselves another one of those feedback loops that we keep finding. This time-lapse sequence compiled from Google Earth Null School's website shows the polar vortex wobbling so much at the start of February this year that it actually breaks completely into two separate circulations, spinning in opposite directions from each other. And if we look at the corresponding jet stream flow for the same period, when we get to about the 27th of February, you can see part of the jet stream over Scandinavia actually being turned around and moving in the wrong direction. And it was this that dragged in the ridiculously titled Beast from the East across Europe and the UK. I suppose the obvious question following that is, so what? We had a bit of snow in the winter. It's the sort of thing our European cousins laugh at us for being so unprepared for when it happens. Of course, we haven't suddenly moved into a realm of completely new weather systems. That's not what the climate scientists seem to be saying. What they are saying is that climate change is tending to nudge our weather systems towards more exaggerated and extreme versions of what we're already used to, and often at unexpected times in the calendar. Here's the east coast of America on the 3rd of April this year, when normally they'd be expecting balmy spring sunshine. And these are just some of the catastrophic flooding events that have been hitting countries around the world in the last two weeks. Here's the UN Secretary General again. The world reached several dire milestones in 2017. The economic costs of climate-related disasters hit a record. 320 billion US dollars. Energy-related carbon dioxide emissions rose 1.4% to 32.5 gigatons, a historic high. 
In 2017, the hurricane season in the Caribbean was the costliest ever, undoing decades of development in an instant. In South Asia, major monsoon floods affected 41 million people. In Africa, severe drought drove nearly 900,000 people from their homes. Wildfires caused destruction across the world, and the Arctic Sea recorded its lowest winter maximum ever. Despite all this gloom and doom, there is still a great deal of value in you and I making our own individual incremental changes, especially when they come together as collective action and not just in home energy, as I'm planning to find out over the course of the next few weeks and months. Anyway, that's it for this week. Please do share the link with your friends and most importantly, hit the red subscribe button. It's the best way to raise the profile of the channel. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good week. And as always, remember to just have a think. See you next week.